Hi everyone, welcome to chapter two, uh, atoms, molecules, and ions. As you know, we are using the Zumdahl and Zumdahl um, book, and uh, we're on page 42. So let's get into it. This chapter is very important, especially for you chemistry beginners. We're going to talk about the language of chemistry in many ways. We're going to be talking about the, a lot of the words and terms we use and we'll be using for um, years to come. Whether you stop on this course, or you go to organic and medicinal chemistry, um, or you just think about your everyday life and how chemistry is involved in it, it's going to, these words are going to be really important. So let's uh, get my lesson plan out here. We're going to hop over to page 43. And we're going to talk about the, the uh, history of chemistry. I'm going to be brief here. I think the history of chemistry is uh, pretty important. But at the same time, um, you can always read this on your own time. Um, you can read about some of the early Greek uh, philosophers, really, more than chemists, um, who contemplated uh, the meaning of life as well as what matter is and so forth. And we had this dark age from, I guess, like 300 BC, where there was a lot of thinking going on with the Aristotles and De Democritus's of the world. And we had this sort of very kind of dark period until the sort of 1400s to the 1600s where there was a very modest amount of thought on the subject. And then finally, it, it sort of really took off and has been exponential since. Um, probably the only other name one would be interested to learn about is a guy named Paracelsus. Um, and then the first real chemist who we will talk about a lot, especially in chapter five, is Robert Boyle. And Boyle lived uh, from in the 1600s, so 1627 to 1691. And Boyle, Boyle was quite important um, in ushering in a new era for chemistry. So we'll, we'll talk all about uh, these famous chemists. And again, if you have your own interest, uh, you can certainly you can certainly look them up yourselves. And I would encourage you to do so. It's, it, it humanizes and Gives, gives a lot of interest to the field if you study the people behind the field. Joseph Priestley was another important guy, uh, 1733 to 1804. He actually was a priest, so there you go. Um, and, uh, and he also participated and was a key chemist in many ways. So let's go to, that's enough about the history of chemistry. We're going to talk a lot about kind of one of the fathers of chemistry, a guy named John Dalton. To this day, Dalton's name is still, it's now, it's now in fact a unit of measurement. Um, the atomic mass unit is often called a Dalton. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, Dalton will figure in prominently. And these are, certainly Dalton and Boyle are two probably the most important chemists ever. And we'll talk more and more about these people as we go on. Um, let's skip, to, skip ahead to page 44. 45, we're going to talk about 2.2, which is fundamental chemical laws. We're going to just go through a few of them. I think the first one is one you may already know, uh, which we call the law of conservation of mass. And what's pretty cool about this is, uh, as a child, this fascinated me a little bit that in a chemical reaction, matter is never created. Matter, I guess we could write that, mass is neither created nor destroyed. And um, this fascinated me as a child because if you take a piece of paper, right, and you burn it, you could actually burn it so that there's nothing left or there's just ashes, right? And it sort of, you looked at the, a piece of paper and you said, gee, it really seems it really seems like matter was destroyed, <laughs> right? If you evaporate, uh, you know, a, a tub of water, 
you know, or a cup of water or something. It certainly seems like matter was destroyed. But uh, this, this is a law, uh, there's no doubt about it. And the person that pioneered it, uh, quite importantly, was someone named Antoine Lavoisier, which is another important name. He was another seven, 1700s chemist. Antoine Lavoisier, Lavoisier um, who was actually executed in the French Revolution, of all things. Um, so this is an important law, and we're going to go through this law of conservation of mass many, many times. And this, this idea um, is quite important when we talk about balancing chemical equations and things like that. There's another gentleman named uh, Joseph Proust. Proust, I don't know. Contemporary of Lavoisier's, who determined this law. It's called the law of definite proportion. And this is sort of a interesting concept, which is a given compound, think about water as an example, a given compound can always contains, always contains exactly the same proportion of elements by mass. It's one water is the same as another water, and it's the same as another water. There, there, there's no water that's an H3O. There's no water that's an H2O2. Always contains exactly the same proportion of elements by mass. If there's no water that's H2.1 O. Right? That's just not how it works. There's no H2.0001 O. And you might say, oh, that, that's a lot like water. It's almost H2O. Nope. It never works that way. The law of definite proportion states clearly water is always H2O. There's no intermediate water. Dalton, who lived, uh, who's probably, again, the most important person of them all, who lived in the late 1700s, and was an English school teacher, interestingly. He was uh, not an academic, really. Um, he was stimulated by this concept, and he ended up, uh, he ended up furthering this law into this concept of the law of multiple proportions law of multiple proportions. And this is sort of a self-evident, I guess, the law of multiple proportions. Proportions. Which is that uh, when two elements form a series of compounds, the ratio of masses is always reduced to small whole numbers. You know, so uh, if you have NO2 and NO3, they're, they're always multiple proportions in the sense that they're interval based. They're kind of quantized in these weights. So if n had an arbitrary weight of x and y had an arbitrary weight of, oxygen had an uh, arbitrary weight of y, the weight would be sort of x2y here and then x3y here. And the point is that uh, we can always reduce these to whole number of coefficients, 1x2y, 1x3y, etc. That's the law of multiple proportions that the ratio of masses can always be reduced to small whole numbers. So Dalton kept thinking and thinking and thinking about, about this stuff. And he came up with an atomic theory. And this was sort of when, when chemistry took a real step forward. Dalton's atomic theory. This is when there was kind of this explosion, really. This explosion of theory and knowledge gained in chemistry. And Dalton had a theory which he presented in 1808 which looks a little like this. The first thing he said was that each element, each element, oops, each element is made up of tiny particles, not the best writer this morning, this afternoon, feels like morning of tiny particles called atoms. 
I remember we defined an element. We defined an element in chapter one as a substance, a pure substance that cannot be broken down uh, any further. That cannot be uh, changed either. Cannot be changed into another element. It's elements like hydrogen, helium, carbon, etc. They're on the periodic table of elements. So Dalton didn't know all of this. Uh, it was 1808. But he proposed that each of these elements um, are made of tiny particles called atoms. And then he also said something kind of basic and, and made a lot of sense. Um, that atoms of the same element are identical. Are always identical, right? Uh, and I always like this idea. Um, you can't have a hydrogen that's worse than another hydrogen. You know, sometimes you think of well, a penny is a penny and a dollar is a dollar. Think of a crinkled up dollar that's old and, and maybe has a tear in it and you can have a nice, crisp, clean dollar that's, that's different and sometimes you see these in your wallet or something like that. But the, uh, in the case of atoms, they're always the same. There's no good hydrogen or bad hydrogen atom. They're always the same hydrogen atoms. They're, they're don't, they don't rust, they don't get old, they don't uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, they're always identical, which is kind of a cool concept. You know, if you think about the universe and all the matter in the universe, there's only about 100 elements, and really less than that that, that matter. Maybe 20 elements where we see most of matter. And all of them are made up of these atoms, and all those atoms are like little Lego blocks, really, for all the things that are around us. And that's pretty crazy if you sit there and, and think about it. You can definitely be fascinated by it. So those are the, the two major parts of, of of uh, Dalton's theory. And he also said some other things that we sort of went over in chapter one and maybe even a little bit earlier with um, the laws of definite proportion and multiple proportions. So let's see here. Dalton tried to reason out and, and theorize atomic weights. He was, he was the first one to start weighing elements and atoms and trying to get a sense for what their relative weights were. And unbelievably, he actually got close to a few of them. He was often wrong, um, but um, he started to understand that you know hydrogen had a lower weight, for instance, than oxygen, which had a much higher weight. It's about 16 times that of hydrogen. And carbon is about 12 times that of hydrogen. So he started to understand that these, these atoms were real and they had weights and it took a while uh, for this to, to continue so let's let's talk a little bit more about um, what happened well there was a guy who came around named Avogadro and Avogadro Amadeo Avogadro was also one of the most important chemists who ever lived and he was also a contemporary he was a contemporary of Dalton's Avogadro and we're gonna get to Avogadro's number which is something that will stick with you I think for the rest of your life and he was born when our country was founded. And so he's a little younger than Dalton, perhaps, but Avogadro came up with a second, less, less celebrated, but according to this lesson plan, it's the first introduction of Avogadro, his Avogadro's hypothesis. This is gonna be very different from what we learned about Avogadro later. It's gonna be related, but Avogadro's hypothesis states that gases contain the same number of particles, the gas law, or gas hypothesis, I guess. Gases contain the same number of particles in the same volume. Different, and this concept is that different gases, oxygen, hydrogen, for instance, different gases, different gases contain the same number of particles if they're in the same amount of value, in the same volume. And you know the same pressure and temperature and things like that. And this was this was this is sort of intuitively difficult to grasp because let's say you had a box, say you had a box of one liter of hydrogen gas, and you had a box of one liter of oxygen gas. It would it's sort of mentally a little difficult. You can imagine the oxygen weighs more. We haven't talked about atomic weight yet. But the, the oxygen weighs more, it's about 16 times more of, uh, than the hydrogen. But the, it has the same number of particles. Think about these H2 particles kind of swimming around. 
for argument's sake, let's say there's four. There's also four oxygens, particles. The interesting thing, though, is even though the atom, the atom, this is, say, O2, the atom is bigger, 16 times bigger, right? The atom is bigger. This is oxygen, this is hydrogen. The same number of particles exist in the same, num same amount. Um, the volumes contain the same number of particles. So this, this is a pretty interesting hypothesis. And the size of the particles may be bigger, may be heavier, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, the, uh, that there are more particles, which is kind of an interesting, interesting hypothesis and turns out to be true. So let's go to uh, page 50. We're on page 50, and we're going to talk about some fun stuff here. Page 50. And we're going to learn a little bit about the first experiments, early experiments, to characterize the atom. And I think that uh, you'll find these kind of cool, and some of these will hopefully stick with you. So the electron was kind of the first, one of the first parts of the atom that we messed around with uh, as scientists. And the very important physicist, J.J. Thompson, let me turn this off. It's rude when I, when people have their phones on. So I apologize for that. All right, J.J. Thompson. And then Thompson did these experiments much later. He built on Dalton's work and, and other Avogadro's work. So he was in the 1800s. In fact, he died about 100 years ago, a little less than 100 years ago. So Thompson did this interesting experiment where you had these cathode tubes. It looks something like that. I'm not a great artist. Cathode ray tubes. And at one end of the tube is a positive charge, at one end of the tube is a negative charge. It's cathode and anode is sort of the way it's called. Um, uh, so in any event, um, he had these electron beam, this sort of electron beam. He didn't know it was an electron beam, but when he, when he cathodes are, are, are sort of vacuums. So when he withdrew all of this, uh, all the content of the tube, there still was this negative sort of beam, this electrical field, and he called it electrons. And he measured the particle of the electron. He actually got very, very close. He got the charge of the electron. He got the mass of the electron almost exactly, almost exactly. And so he, he reasoned that electrons um, were part of all, all atoms had electrons. And he really started to divine, he really started to divine some of these uh, models. Um, atoms were electrically neutral. So he sort of started to understand that electrons were there around an atom. What ended up happening is there started to become this, this sort of um, concept called the plum pudding model. And I think we'll dispel it in a minute, but at least for a couple hundred years, there was this concept that, um, that um, atoms were like pudding. There's a big lump of pudding, there was a nucleus, like maybe a plum, and there were these electrons that were like stuck, stuck in the pudding circulating around this positively charged nucleus. So electrons are negatively charged. And this sort of, uh, this, this, the, the experiment that Thompson did didn't do anything to, to dispel that. We'll, we'll soon learn that the atom is much more dynamic than this, but the plum pudding model was definitely a, a, a popular way to explain how the atom was, um, no longer proven to be the case. So there was another experiment uh, by, I tend, to, I tend to skip it, but I feel bad for this guy's life's work. Robert Millikan was a contemporary of Thompson, and he did these charged uh, oil drops, he did these interesting oil drop experiments. And he, what he did with these experiments is he was, able to, he was able to tell the mass of an electron. I won't go through how the experiment worked. You can certainly do that yourself. But he determined the mass of the electron was nine 
times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. So very, 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 very low mass, but close to infinitesimally small mass, but it has a mass nonetheless. So that was sort of uh, an important experiment. Now let's get to probably the most exciting and interesting experiment ever, ever conducted, I would argue. This is the most interesting experiment ever conducted in the history of science. And it was by a guy named Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford, and he did this in 1911. He lived from 1871 to 1937. So this wasn't that long ago, right? It was 100 years ago, 1911. We still didn't really understand the atom. All we had was that plum pudding model, which wasn't so bad, I guess. Um, and this experiment, he did this wild, wild idea. He had this thing called an alpha particle, which is this very positively charged beam. And he shot out the beam positively charged beam he shot out. Bam. And what was he shooting it at? It was interesting. He had this he had this detector built like this so he could tell if the beam hit the detector. That makes sense, right? He could tell if the beam hit the detector. And you would expect in the middle he placed this gold foil. This thin gold foil. Maybe like an atom's, an, one atom in length across. And he wanted to see, and he said, oh, you know what, most, almost all of my hits are going to be right here, right? I'm going to shoot it in a straight line, and the detector is going to ping, go off here, go off here, go off here. And what ended up happening was that some, some of the pings ended up being here, and here, and here, and here here and he said he was so surprised he said it was like shooting a howitzer cannon at a piece of tissue paper and having it bounce right back at you it was such a fascinating result and he said that there must be a positively charged part of that gold atom that when I shoot my positive particle at it, it is bouncing and repelling it and he started thinking well, maybe the nucleus Maybe there's a nuclear center of an atom. And this concept of the nucleus started to be born, born, where you have this dense, very dense center of the atom. And the electrons are kind of swimming around. They're negatively charged. And that is sort of the model we use. But Rutherford was able to sort of get get an understanding of, of that 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 this that it wasn't so much a plum pudding model that this was empty space. Most of an atom is empty space. So when you shoot when you're shooting these positive particles at it, that's why most of them do end up here. But occasionally one will bang into the nucleus and say, "Whoa, positive positive charge! We got to repel and bounce us back." So most of the atom is empty space, it turns out. In fact, the nucleus is the size of a marble in a baseball field. So you think about that. So when he shot, when he shot those particles into the baseball field, it's like hitting that marble and having it bounce back. A few of them did do that. But uh, that's how empty, if an atom is a baseball field, the nucleus is one marble in one chair in the baseball field. And the electrons are swimming around that baseball field. Let that sink in a little bit. So now we're, as you can tell, we're moving off of the history and we're just going to talk about the modern view of atomic structure a little bit. And here's where our lesson really starts, I'd say. A little warm up of history and things like that. But let's, let's go wild here. So. We have three atomic particles, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. We know the electron is negatively charged. We know, thanks to Rutherford, we know this from Thomson's experiments, we know that, thanks to Rutherford, that the proton is, is positively charged, and it's, it's part of the nucleus, the nucleus. We know that 
the electron is not in the nucleus, not in the nucleus. That's all we'll disclose right now. We'll learn all about electrons. We'll learn all about electrons shortly. Neutrons are interesting. They have neutral charge, right? No charge. And they are part of the nucleus, and we'll talk about neutrons more and more. They're not that important, but uh, they do exist. They do exist, and they do have the... Um, they do have... Uh, they do have mass, and if you think about it, they're neutrally charged, so we'll just we'll put them like that. So here's an atom with two protons and two neutrons. Almost all of the mass, the electron is close to, so close to zero, we're going to say it's massless. Whereas a neutron has a mass, so let's just say of one, and a proton has a mass of, let's just say, one. Mass unit. So if you think about it, all of the mass, all of the weight of an atom is actually in its nucleus. So, before we move on, so these are, these are important things that are going to come up over and over and over again. We're just going to talk quickly about something called an isotope. So an isotope is an atom with a different number of neutrons. We identify atoms by the number of protons they have. We'll talk about that in just two seconds. number of neutrons, but same number of protons. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about is, so now that we have sort of these definitions here, I want to talk to you about the atomic number. The atomic number, we're going to use that as the Z number. Z. Call it the Z number. It's the number of protons. It's pretty easy. Pretty easy. But this is really important. It's like the ID, it's like the ID number for an, for an elements, for elements. And this is, uh, we're going to jump a little bit ahead to the periodic table, but if you look at how the periodic table is set up, you have hydrogen, helium, lithium, this is one, two, three, and these are the Z numbers, these are the atomic numbers. Beryllium, Boron, little gap there, and then carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. And it keeps going. It's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And these are the number of protons in each of these elements. So hydrogen has one proton. It has one proton. We know atoms are neutrally charged, so it has to have one electron flying around it. We know that the plum pudding model doesn't really work, so think, and then we're, we're going to think about the orbital model, where it's going around it in an orbit like a planet around uh, a sun. And we'll find out that that's wrong, too, that it's really more complicated than both of those things. Um, but that's sort of the atomic number of hydrogen is one. A hydrogen can't have more protons or less protons. If it had two protons, it's not hydrogen anymore. Then it's helium. So the Z number, the atomic number, identifies, they say identifies what element we're, we're, we're looking at, what atom of what element. It's ID number, in essence. So this is an electron flying around. We need two electrons to be helium. Could be a helium ion, I suppose. We'll talk about that in a second. So that's the atomic number. The atomic weight is interesting. That's it's the mass number. Uh, you'll often see that. That's the weight of the atom, and we'll refer to that as a, the a number. The a number. And we'll, we'll, the a number is very easy to calculate. Remember the mass. What are the masses of our particles? Protons is one. The neutron is one, and the electron is zero. So you just add up the neutrons and the protons, and you get the weight. So in most atoms, in most atoms, let's just take oxygen. 
We look up in our periodic table, where's oxygen? Well, it's number eight. Here's my brief periodic table. Here it is, oxygen, eight. So that means, means it has eight protons. Most atoms will have the same number of neutrons, protons, and electrons if they're, if they're mutually charged atoms. There's one exception, which is hydrogen. So let's see, eight times one is eight. Eight times one is eight. Eight times zero is zero. So the atomic weight of oxygen is 16. And if you look, if you look at the atomic weight in the periodic table, it says 16. That makes sense, that's pretty easy. And how would, how would we write this? One of the ways we write this, if we want to describe one atom of oxygen, we actually write it like this. The format is A, Z, and then element. So if I wanted to just say, talk about one oxygen atom of a certain kind, I would say 16, atomic weight, eight, and then O. This is a oxygen atom, you can tell immediately because of the eight, but it has eight neutrons. Now remember I said you can have an isotope. You have an atom with a different number of neutrons and the same number of protons. So you could have nine neutrons in, in oxygen. It would still be oxygen because the neutrons are neutrally charged. They don't really do much. They don't really change the properties of the atom. The protons and electrons are very important. But neutrons, not so much. So this is an isotope of oxygen called 17 oxygen. 17 oxygen, or oxygen 17. You've, you've heard of carbon, carbon dating, and things like that, carbon 14. Let's look at that real quick. Carbon has an atomic number of six, right? So most carbon is carbon 12. Six protons, six electrons to pair it off, and six neutrons. But there are some carbons Remember, it has to always have six protons, or it's never going to be carbon. Seven would make it uh, nitrogen, right? So it can't, be, it can't be more protons. Electrons change the charge. We'll talk about that in a second. Those are called ions. You change the electrons. We'll talk all about ions in chemistry. Neutrons make it an isotope, changing the neutrons. So there are some carbon isotopes that have eight neutrons, and we call that carbon-14. Carbon-14. Carbon-14 has a half-life. I forget what it is. It's like a thousands of years, I think. And it decays back into carbon-12. And that time of decay is so, is so um, how should I put it, is so uh, reliable that you can determine how old something is based on how much carbon-14 it has. We'll talk all about that. But let's, let's move on to the next section. We'll talk about molecules and ions. More introduction to chemistry. Molecules and ions. We'll talk all about this stuff in more detail. This is a nice primer, primer for the vocabulary here. And you might want to have to watch this video two or three times because this stuff is so important. It is so important. I spent my whole life thinking about these concepts, so it comes easy to me. But if, it, if any of this is difficult, I would encourage you to watch it really carefully. You can always DM me on Twitter. My DMs are open to anyone. Uh, that's probably one way to get me. You can get me on some of the chats we do. You can type in the YouTube chat. It's not always easy to get a hold of me, but there is often other people who are willing to help out as well, especially the moderators. Uh, you can trust the moderators. All right, molecules and ions. So one of the ways that atoms come together, atoms come together, to form molecules. So we're comfortable, we're comfortable with the idea of a hydrogen atom, right? It's got one proton, one electron. It actually has no neutrons. It's probably the only element that doesn't have any neutrons. It's very interesting. It's very different. And we're comfortable with the idea of an oxygen atom. It's got, uh, what, eight protons, eight electrons, and eight neutrons. And these guys come together, two hydrogen atoms will come together with oxygen to make H2O, which is water. We're, I think, a large percentage water. We drink water, we live on water. And that's sort of the, the nature of, of how the molecules work. And how, how do they come together? They form something called a bond. Not like a stock in a bond, but a chemical bond. 
We'll talk about stock bonds in another video. But this is chemical bonds. What kind of bond? What is a bond? Well, there's two kinds of bonds we'll think about broadly. This is this oxygen and hydrogen form something called a covalent bond. And a covalent bond means that they share. They're going to be sharing electrons. All bonding takes place with electrons. This is really important. All bonding takes place with electrons. The electrons are kind of the bonding agent in these atoms. So hydrogen and oxygen form a covalent bond where oxygen is sharing some electrons with hydrogen, hydrogen is sharing some electrons with oxygen, and they become happy. We're going to talk about happiness or content quite a bit in, in bonding. We're going to go through this in more detail, but just think about these elements wanting to be more satisfied. There's a perfectly scientific reason. They're not actually happy or anything. But there's a scientific reason why they want to do this. And so this becomes a molecule. Once a bond happens, you get a molecule. Once two atoms have bonded, once they come together, that's a Beatles song, they bond to form molecules. So let's, let's put that in the back of our head. So how do we write, how do we describe these molecules? Well, you can use something called a chemical formula. And you've seen this before. You have something like H2O, or you have CH4, which is methane gas, or you have NH3, which is ammonia, et cetera, et cetera. You can have a really long formula often. They're never too long, or you can't have more than four or five elements in any given molecule. Um, but that's sort of how, how we do it. We can also do a structural formula. We can actually try to draw actually try to draw the molecule. Structural formula. So how would we draw water? We could draw it like this. We could put the oxygen here, and the hydrogen here, and the hydrogen here. And we've drawn the structure, the structure of water. We could also do it like this. This is a little less accurate. This is what it looks like in real life, but they're both right. They're both right. Um, and that's the structural formula. Methane, let's draw this one. This looks like this. Looks like that. Ammonia looks like this. This is the structural formulas, and they're a lot of fun to draw. They're a lot of fun to draw. And we're going to be drawing them for the rest of our lives in chemistry. And being able to interpret them and draw them is, is very important. So let's talk about ions. Ions, you might have seen this in Star Wars, <laughs> but they're all they are, they're charged molecules, charged atoms or molecules. So what's this charge mean? Well, it's when you have, let's take, let's take uh, oxygen or, or something like that, six protons, six electrons, six neutrons. Now I told you we can't change the protons. We change the proton we're going to be changing oxygen if it had five to nitrogen, or if it had seven to fluorine. And it's basically not possible, it's basically not possible to change the number of protons in an atom. You know, there are some exceptions in nuclear physics, but in general, you can't just change oxygen to nitrogen. It doesn't, it's not going to go well. It's impossible. There's always going to be oxygen. You cannot change that. Um, you can't change it to nitrogen or fluorine easily. And if you change the neutrons, it's not going to be, it, the charge won't change. The neutrons are neutrally charged. You just get an isotope. You get a, it'll be heavier, it'll be heavier than normal oxygen, but that's about it. You can get seven neutrons or eight neutrons. What happens if you change the electrons? That's where we get ions. So we added an electron, we have seven electrons, and it would be negatively charged because there's one more negative charged electron. And in fact, it would have seven electrons versus six protons. So the charge is plus one for a proton, the charge is minus one for an electron. So you actually have minus one total charge. And we call this an oxygen ion. Negatively charged oxygen ion. And negative ions we call anions. Positive ions we call cations. You have a positive ion if you lose an electron. So if oxygen somehow could have five electrons, it would be positively charged because it would have more positive charges than negative charges. And we call that a cation. I always remember these by remembering how much I love cats. And cats are positive to my, to my uh, psych, psych, psychic makeup. 
and the other one is negative, obviously. Anion, it kind of sounds like onion, it's negative. Cation, it should bring you positive thoughts, positive. And these are these will be easy to remember as you gain more exposure. Let me space up in here. All right. So, one of the ways that uh, the other way I talk, we talk about covalent bonds and sharing. There's ionic bonds, ionic bonds. which are not sharing. In fact, they're sort of taking, if you think of it that way. They're sort of, uh, um, sort of, uh, uh, there's, there's this taking of electrons. It's unequal, very unequal sharing. So one of the bonds that forms is table salt, sodium chloride. The sodium forms a cation and the chloride forms an anion. And what happens is the sodium electron goes to the chloride and it becomes negatively charged because it's got that extra electron and the sodium is positively charged because it's lost an electron. It's lost an electron. And of course, these are the sodium that's positively charged, the cation is attracted to the chloride that's an anion. So that attraction brings them together to make table salt. The opposites attract when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, atoms and ions. Finally, there's polyatomic ions. So you can have an ion of a molecule. We call that a polyatomic ion. We're going to learn a lot about polyatomic ions. It's going to be a little painful. We're going to do that. In I think we're going to do that later in the chapter. Later in the chapter. So you can have something that's that's a, like NH4 that's a cation. So this is this is a cation. NH4 plus. It is positively charged. So even though it's a molecule, it can be charged neutrally, positively or negatively. So I gave you a quick introduction to the periodic table. Uh, give you a quick introduction to the periodic table. I kind of drew one out. Hydrogen, which is one. It's got a weight of one. Kind of draw it in a little box. We've got helium over here. It's number two. I think its weight is like four. And you can keep drawing this, or you can Google periodic table and one will pop up very quickly. I'm not gonna draw all the weights because I'll probably get one wrong. And, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna draw a couple more just because this will be helpful to you. I think it goes like this. Sneak a peek at the table just in case I don't want to embarrass myself or anything. It's in the period here. Aluminum. Etc. And so, so anyway, this is what the periodic table looks like with a bunch of boxes, in essence. I'm running out of room because I'm not drawing it very well. Draw thinner boxes. All right. So here's what the periodic table looks like, and I can keep putting them in in here. I can constantly draw these, and it, it's a big table, as you know. So this is an abridged table. It's a very big table. So I'll, I'll just draw a few more, just so. It's somewhat complete, at least on this on this scale. Okay, so in the periodic table, these are uh, the periods. Interestingly, are are the rows. I hope I got that right. Yes, <laughs> of course. And the groups are are the vertical columns. These are the families or groups. So this group is called the alkali metals. Groups have usually have names. These this group's called the halogens. Halogens are very important. This group or family is called the noble gases. These are the periods. We don't think too hard about the periods as, as much. Interestingly, the, the groups, we group them because they have the similar similar properties. The alkali metals, for instance, are very active. 
They're reactive. Noble gases, not reactive. All of these are noble gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, and they're all non-reactive. Not reactive. Halogens are all very reactive. They all form anions. In fact, these are all metals. These are all metals. Everything to the left of this line is a metal. Everything to the right is a non-metal. Metals form cations. They tend to lose electrons. Non-metals form anions. They tend to gain electrons and be negatively charged. We'll learn all about why. We're going to look at the periodic table a lot. It's going to be very important to us. And again, some of this is second nature to me. It's not second nature to you. Feel free to ask questions and, and uh, definitely, uh, definitely uh, review this video as often as you need to. Review other videos. Um, you know, there's, there's UC Berkeley chemistry, there's Khan Academy chemistry. I'm not the only person, but if my success in life and my ascribing importance to this process motivates you to watch this video, um, great. But I, I certainly am not the only one, and I'm certainly not the best one. So, uh, But we are going to learn more and more about the periodic table. So naming compounds. We're almost done with this chapter. This is the last section. It's called naming compounds. We're going to go through this, and it's going to be a little painful, but it's going to be satisfying because we're going to learn how to name some elementary compounds. And we're going to call them binary compounds binary compounds. And there's some rules in naming compounds and, that, and there's some that they're not easy, but the first kind of compound I want to learn is an ionic, how to name an ionic compound. So if you have something like NaCl or Ki or something like that, CaS, the anion is always second in naming and the cation is always first. And remember, the way we can tell which one is which, you maybe say, I, don't, I barely know what a cation and anion is. I know cats are positively charged, and anion is negatively charged, but I'm so confused, help me. No, 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 you don't have to be confused. Just go to the periodic table, the one we drew, and say, all right, sodium is a metal. It's all the way on the left of the periodic table. And I know that metals form cations. They lose electrons. Uh, to form positive charges. So sodium is the cation. And chlorine, here's chlorine, it's on the right side of the periodic table, so it must be a nonmetal. It must be a nonmetal. So it must be the anion of the situation. I always think that with my girlfriend, I'm the cation. I'm always positive and she's always negative, but that's, that's another story for another day. Um, so that's that's the, this is an ionic compound, and this is the cation, and this is the, the anion. So we know that the cation goes first, so we're going to say sodium chlorine, is that right? No. We take the anion and we make the ending IDE. So we're going to make it sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Does anyone know how we would do Ki, well, let's go to the periodic table. And I'll just tell you that iodine is down here. Here's where iodine is. We got potassium, which is here, and iodine, which is here. So how do we name this? Potassium iodine? No, it's potassium iodide. Potassium iodide. That's pretty easy. That's how we name. That's how we name these. And if it's hydrogen, we'll say hydride. Hydride. If it's fluorine, we'll say fluoride. Sodium fluoride. Uh, chloride, bromide, iodide. We'll say oxide if we have to. And sometimes we use these common names. Common names. You're not going to hear us say dihydrogen oxide, even though you could. Let's just say water.
Now sometimes ions have two different kinds of charges. A good example is iron. Iron is a cat is a metal, of course, we know that. So it's a cation. <clears throat> but it can form two different kinds of charges. It can lose two electrons or it can lose three electrons. And you can imagine that we want to match it with ions and ions that lose two or three electrons to be negatively charged so that we have a neutral molecule. One atom that always seems to lose two electrons is oxygen. And iron definitely can, well it gains two electrons, gains two electrons to be negatively charged. Iron loves to donate two electrons, so we could have FeO. We can have FeO, but, or FeCl, Cl2. Cl loses one electron, but we can have two of them. So you have Cl gains one electron, excuse me, gains one electron, gains one negative charge. Sometimes you can slip up when you think about these positive and negative charges. It can be a little confusing. Chlorine wants, wants electrons. Iron loves to give them up, so FeCl, but why not have FeCl3? We can have three chlorines with three negative one charges, and one of the irons with its plus three configuration, so that can, that can happen too. So how do we write down, we know iron, or we know we're gonna say oxide or iron chloride, but what happens when we wanna say iron chloride twice? Which one is it? Obviously these are different. One is FeCl2 and one is FeCl3. Well, we actually write it like this. We'll say Fe2, iron 2 chloride or iron 3 chloride. So we'll actually just indicate the charge in parentheses. We used to have these uh, difficult, uh, difficult uh, ferrous and ferric chloride and we sort of have moved on from using the, that naming system. Let's do some examples to make sure we, we understand this. In the book, yeah, I'm on page 62. I think this is pretty important, so I wanna do some of these examples. So they say, give us the systematic name for the following following compounds. All right, so the first one is easy, I think. Cu is copper, Cl is chlorine, but we're gonna say copper chloride, copper chloride. But copper can form different kinds of cations. We know chlorine always takes a negative one because it's a halogen, it's in the seventh column always takes a negative one. Well, we'll talk about why. So in this case, it has to be copper one, because copper can be a plus one or a plus two. How about this one? This is mercury, and this is oxygen, so it's the anion, so we're gonna say mercury oxide. But again, oxygen takes a negative two. Mercury can take a negative two or a negative three, I believe. So we're gonna say mercury two oxide. And this one's pretty complicated. Well, we got iron, which we know does plus two or plus three. You know, oxygen only does minus two. So we have three oxygens, so the total negative charge will be minus six. We only have two irons, so we know it's gonna have to be the, the plus three kind to balance it out. So this is gonna be iron three oxide. And we'll learn all about these charge things. If these are a little bit confusing to you, don't worry about it, um, but uh, we'll, we'll get there soon. What's next? We're gonna talk about polyatomic ions. This will be the last part of this, polyatomic ions. As I mentioned, you can have ions that have more than one atom in them. We call that polyatomic ions. So here's, here's my favorite example is NH4, which is positively charged. And that is ammonium, they have names. This is ammonium. How about another one? Let's look at nitrate. Nitrate, uh, nitrate is NO3 minus, nitrate. So you can imagine these two guys would love to bond together. One is a positive charge, 
plus one. One is a negative charge, minus one. So this guy would love to form this NH4NO3. And do they do? This is a neutral now. It's a neutral charge. So unfortunately, we have to learn all of these polyatomic ions. We have to learn all of these polyatomic ions. And there's a list on page 65. I can recommend that you print it out and you test yourself on it and try to memorize it. If you don't want to memorize it, just keep it handy. Post it up in your wall. Polyatomic ions chart. And I like to test my memory of polyatomic ions. I'm not going to draw them all out for you right now. You can see them on page 65, but let's, let's look at a few of them, okay? Let's look at the chloride ions. There's ClO minus, there's ClO2 minus, there's ClO3 minus, and there's ClO4 minus. So how the heck are we going to name all these things? So we actually have a system. We actually have a system. We can, we're going to call this one chlor, chlorite. We're going to call this one chlorate. And the, the whole ite eight thing, the ite and the eight, when we have oxy, oxy anions, oxygen form, always forms, oxygen is so important, right? It always forms these two minus anions. There's so many oxygen anions, we're going to call them oxy anions. And in oxy anions, the fewer oxygens will be named the ite, and the one that has the more oxygens will be named the eight. Ite and eight. And if there's one that's got even more, the one that's got even more, we're going to call it per. And that's going to be a prefix, not a suffix. Per. And if it's got fewer, even fewer than ite, we're going to call it hypo. So this guy is called hypochlorite. Hypo means below, like hypothermia, right? So this is like chloride, except it's hypo. It's got even one less oxygen. And this is not hyper, so instead we're going to call it per, perchlorate. And this applies as well in a different one called nitrogen. So nitrogen NO2 minus and NO3 minus. There's no NO minus and there's no NO4 minus. So this is easy. We're just going to call this nitrite. We'll call this nitrate. Easy peasy. It's got more oxygen, so it's a nitrate. It's got less oxygen, so it's a nitrite. And this, this happens a few times. There's a couple of really important polyatomic ions you got to know. OH minus, probably the most important polyatomic ion there is, and we just call that hydroxide. You're gonna see, you're gonna see this a lot in life. Trust me, you wanna know that, hydroxide. All right, all right. So again, I would encourage you to study the, the polyatomic ions. You'll be better for it, trust me. Um, and when we name polyatomic ions, it sort of works the same way. Let's, let's look at one real quick. Na2SO4. Well, if you looked at the polyatomic ion chart, there is an SO4 2 minus ion. There's an SO4 2 minus ion, and it's, uh, it's called sulfate. You can imagine that there's a sulfite. It's SO3 2 minus. Sulfite. There's no hyposulfite or hypersulfate. So there's just sulfite and sulfate. So we have Na2SO4. So we know when we name this, we're going to put this part's going to be sulfate, right? This part's going to be sulfate. What are we going to say about this? You may be tempted to say disodium, disodium sulfate. But the answer is just sodium sulfate. Because we know when we write Na2SO4, when we write Na2SO4, We know there's a sulfate, which is always SO4. And we know that this is not a charged molecule, otherwise it would have a plus or a minus up here. It's not charged, it's neutral. And we know, because we're great chemists, we know when we study our stuff, we know that SO4 is a negative two charge. So if, need, if it's gonna be sodium sulfate, it's gonna have to have two, we know that sodium is a plus one charge. It's in the period first, it's the first uh, family in the periodic table, first group, so that's why it's plus one. All those guys are plus one. So we know we need two to balance the sulfate charge. So we, we can even see sodium sulfate written down. And we can start to say, all right, how do I, what do I do? How do I turn this, how do I turn this into, a, into a chemical formula? Well, I know sulfate is SO4, all right? 
And I'm in the back of my head, I know that there's kind of like a two minus charge floating around here. I know that. And then I see sodium, so I gotta write Na in front of it. But it's not a charged molecule. It's not a charged molecule, because it's sodium sulfate. So it's gonna be Na2SO4. And that's sort of the way we, we think about that. All right? So if we have a binary covalent, we have a couple more naming things, and then we're done. Binary, because we're going to use a lot of names in chemistry. you got to learn language first. Binary covalent compounds on page 67. So there's, here's a bunch of confusing, confusing nitrogen covalent compounds. N2O, NO, NO2, N2O3, N2O4, etc. So how do we name all these guys? So let's start with this one. We're gonna call this di-nitrogen monoxide. We actually will always use the, the anion concept with the ide, but we will denote them with prefixes, including mono. But we never use mono in the first element. So we're never going to say mono nitrogen or mono carbon. So we do CO2, it's carbon. Even though it's a mono, we're not going to use the mono for the first one. And it's not carbon oxygen, it's not carbon dioxygen, it's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. It's so an oxide, so we use the anion IDE, and we have to use the prefix, carbon dioxide. If it's CO, it's carbon monoxide. We have to use the prefix. So here, it's dinitrogen monoxide. Here, it's nitrogen monoxide. Remember, for the, for the cation, or not the cation, but the first element, we never use mono, even if it's mono. Nitrogen monoxide. You can pause the video and ask yourself, what would NO2 be? NO2 be. Simple, it's nitrogen dioxide. How about this one? Pause the video now and tell me what this one is. Well, it's pretty easy. It's dinitrogen. You can use the di in this case because it's not a mono. Remember, we never use mono, so it's dinitrogen. Trioxide, trioxide. And for this one, it's tetraoxide, tetraoxide. And sometimes we have these common names, like water or whatever, common names. And we do have some common names here. We actually call this nitrous, nitrous oxide. And we call this one nitric oxide. You might see these names, and unfortunately, you just have to memorize these common names. Another common name is NH3. We call that just ammonia. Ammonia. It has no rhyme or reason. It's just called ammonia. And unfortunately, you got to learn these sometimes. All right, we're almost at the end. You got five, five more minutes at best, and we're going to learn about acids. We have chapters and chapters and chapters on acids. On page 69 here, the last page. We've got chapters and chapters and chapters on acids, and we're going to learn all about acids. But before we do that, we're going to learn about how to name acids. And so acids uh, form H plus ions, or protons. Remember, hydrogen just has one proton and one electron. So if it loses its electron, all that's left is a proton. So a hydrogen ion, a hydrogen cation, is just simply a proton. So anything. Anytime that happens, we'll call that an acid. So how do we name acids? Well, uh, it's a little complicated. Um, so if we have HCl, we're going to call this hydro. We're always going to take that H and call it, we'll name it hydro with the prefix. And then if the name of the anion ends in ide, like chloride, we're going to replace that with an ic. Hydrochloric. So this is literally hydrochloric acid. Let's do a few more. Let's do a few more. 
HF. Well, you got the hydrogen, so I'm going to say hydro. I know this would normally be hydrogen fluoride, but because it's an acid, it forms an H plus and an F minus ionic bond. We're going to call this hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid. It's an acid if it's an H plus. All right, how about uh, we did HCl? How about HBr? This is hydro. Bromic acid, perfect for PharmaBro, etc., etc. Now, how about polyatomic acids? Well, we've got HClO. We learned this one, right? This was ClO minus and H plus. ClO minus is hypochlorite. If you remember your polyatomic ions, hypochlorite. So we actually call this hydrogen. Or we can actually call it, um, we actually will call it hypochloric acid, hypochlorous acid. And what rule, what rule do we use for that? Let's see, hypo, let me introduce you to a new rule, hypochlorous acid. So we don't use the hydrogen for this one. So if it's in, <laughs> it's complicated here. Um, if, the, if the term is an eight, the anion is an eight. We'll convert that to an ick. If the if it's an it, we'll convert that to an us. Us. Eight becomes ick. It becomes us. So, lots of fun here. If it's an oxygen-containing acid, if it's an oxygen-containing acid, we can skip the hydrogen part. So let's look at uh, HNO2 minus. If you remember your polyatomic ions, there's no minus, so it's NO2 minus. The ion is what again? It's nitrite, right? So we're, because this is an oxygen-containing acid, it will form the H plus ion and will form the NO2 minus nitrite ion. We'll actually call this one nitric, nitric acid. Nitric acid. Let's do one more oxy acid and we'll be done. Do one more oxy acid and we'll be done. H2SO4. We know this is an acid. We can tell immediately because there's a hydrogen ion. To be balanced, we know SO4. We learned that a few times. This is sulfate. This is sulfate. We know it's going to have to be two hydrogen ions to balance this out. Each hydrogen is a plus one, right? So we're going to need two hydrogens. So this will form together and form this guy. Now, what do we? how do we say this guy? Remember, because it's an oxygen-containing acid, it's an oxygen-containing acid. We don't need the hydrogen in front. We don't need to say, like, hydrofluoric acid or hydrochloric acid. We would not say hydrosulfic acid. That would not work. So what we're going to say instead is we're going to say sulfurous acid, sulfurous acid, or sulfuric acid. Which one? Well, it's sulfate. It's SO4 2 minus. Sulfite, right? Sulfite is SO3 minus, 2 minus. So H2SO4 sulfate is sulfuric acid. 8 becomes ick. And us, I guess, stays us. So H2SO3 is sulfurous acid. Sulfurous acid. H2SO4 is sulfuric acid. Sulfate, sulfuric. So, it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I would study the book very carefully. Um, you know, all of these names get easier with practice, so don't get, get too discouraged. It's a lot of rules. Uh, you'll, you know, if you get a name wrong here or there, it's not going to kill you. It might if you're making an important reaction. Uh, that's where I would triple check it. But it won't kill you on a test or anything like that. It won't kill you with me.
uh, I'll kind of get these wrong here and there. So in any event, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, we learned a lot about the naming conventions and the basic vocabulary of, um, of all of this. Um, so uh, chapter three will deal with um, stoichiometry. So we'll start to actually talk about how to measure reactions and do the math of reactions. So I hope you had fun. I'll talk to you all soon.